Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is this water for me or is it someone else's water? I think it was two minutes. Oh, okay, great. I was going to say, I just want to know whose germs I'm getting. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, some of you know me really well. Some of you don't at all. As I look out, I'm like, oh my gosh, we have so many new faces and I'm excited to see you all here. As a preface, some things you should know about me um, are that I used to be the Minister of Discipleship here at God's House, so I'm highly invested in this place and these people. This is my family, and uh, that means you are. And uh, you should also know that I'm a little bit hippie, a little bit hood, <laughs> with a dash, and that I, I'm thrown in a dash of diva. Okay, so I got a little bit hippie, a little bit hood, dash of diva. You'll hear that come out in me, so don't be surprised. You probably don't need to know my entire life story, but there's reasons for each of those pieces. And um, I am the executive director of a nonprofit organization here in Marion called Lark Song. So I'm really very, very all about fulfillment and flourishing and people um, being their best and truest selves. So when DJ asked if I would do this series, I was like, yes. And I immediately thought, okay, what's, what's the ordinary, passionate thing I could talk about? And it would usually be flourishing and fulfillment or purpose or calling, right? And as I was thinking about it, I just thought, uh, there's some, there was something churning in me um, around some things that I've heard not necessarily like from Anthony, but no, <laughs> around some things that I've heard just online or like articles that have been written that a whole bunch of my friends have been like, yes, like, love, whatever. And I'm like, really? Um, or things that people have said, basically excuses for not growing in your faith or not going to church or not, you know, whatever. And I was like, man, we need to get back to basics. Like, we need to understand what roots us before we can understand how to flourish, right? So we're going into this series called Sacred Roots. Um, and I think that the reason I want to take us into this place, which sacred just means, like, dedicated to um, dedicated to God or revered as highly important or um, precious. And then roots, you guys know, I think, are part of a plant, right? And they do a lot of things. As I was studying about roots, I was like, oh yeah, it sucks up nutrients and it stabilizes the plant so it doesn't fall over, right? Like I knew that part. But it actually gives and takes nutrients from the soil, which I think is really interesting. Um, roots, yeah, let me get my notes here. Roots um, absorb nutrients. They also distribute nutrients. They also store up nutrients so that if there's a time that the soil's not giving it to them, it can still nourish the plant. Um, it anchors the plant so that it doesn't blow away or fall over, right? It protects the soil that it's been planted in. Isn't that cool? Um, and it also creates healthy soil for new plants to grow. Because roots break up rocks, they like break up the soil and um, distribute different nutrients and they make it easy for um, air and water and other things to get into the soil. If we didn't have uh, root systems, we wouldn't have natural irrigation and healthy soil for new plants to then grow. Okay, so if we as the church um, want to create health in the community around us, and we want to start planting new things so that the world becomes better, then maybe we should pay attention to our roots, right? I think sometimes we're really, really concerned about being cool. Anybody really want to be cool? I'm like the only person. <laughs> like I really, I think cool people are really cool. 
right? So sometimes I want to just be cool. And in becoming cool, we lose being reverent, right? In like pursuing this cool factor, we forget sometimes what's actually really important. And then sometimes, okay, well, maybe I don't need to be cool, but I at at least need to be relevant, right? Like, I at least need to be able to influence and impact, and I'm okay being different. Like, I actually want, some of us actually want to be different, because that's cool, and relevant, right? But in being relevant, we forget our roots. And without rootedness, relevance isn't sustainable, right? Does this make sense? Okay, so I think that God's house as a whole wants to be relevant, but that relevance needs sustainability. And it will not have sustainability unless we have rootedness. And the place to go for rootedness are ancient paths and ancient practices that are found in Scripture. So that's where we're going to go, okay? There's two reasons that we're doing this series. The first reason is, oh, and y'all... You have notes, right? I made these notes for you, okay? If you need, we're going to just take care of some logistics real quick, okay, ushers and stuff. If you need this fill in, I mean, like, you can just fill in a word. That way you don't have to take pages of journal notes because I know you're just going to soak this up, right? <laughs> but if you, if you need a n- note a page, just raise your hand and the ushers will bring one to you, Okay. Keep it raised, keep it raised. Thanks. Drew, are you bringing them? Yeah. Um, Anna, sure, great. The other thing is that you should have gotten when you came in is a brown strip of paper, okay? If you need a brown strip of paper, raise your hand, and we'll bring you a brown strip of paper. Got to get these logistics taken care of first so you can have a full experience. Keep that, keep those hands up. Right, yeah, Evan. I love how it's like our leadership that doesn't have, that doesn't have what they need. <laughs> they are busy. Yeah, they don't get back to that front door sometimes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It was my four year our uh, our companies, my organization's four-year birthday this last last week, so kind of a big deal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> kind of cool and relevant, you know. Um, okay, everyone good now? Our whole family's taken care of. Some, but, but, uh, Joe, you needs a pencil or pen? Anybody else need a pencil or a pen? I don't want you just pretending that you're writing down, like, oh, yeah. Okay, you got it? All right. Have someone next to you help you. Okay, so now we're ready. So you guys all see why this series. Oh, we've got some hands over here. Pens, you need some writing implements. Okay, note to self, put pens in pews. Right? All right, so why this series? The first reason uh, for this series is that our churches need strengthening. I've seen a lot of people and pastors and leadership just leaving churches and churches closing and stuff like that. So I got into, I tried to research like, oh man, people just leaving churches. They're not coming to church anymore. Actually, church attendance hasn't really changed that much in the past 70 years. So that was kind of a bias, right? People just like kind of move around and sometimes they go to church and sometimes they don't go to church. But to actually get rooted in a place where you are being nourished and you are impacting as well, to actually have that sort of church body experience seems to be pretty rare. And we, I really want to make that less rare. So here, number one, our churches need strengthening, both here and others outside of here. The second reason for this series is that our callings need clarity. So 
we're going to be looking at some spiritual practices for real people, all right? Um, I, I, yeah, I'm not going to get up here and be like, all right, so solitude in your closet that you paint and have the paint and then you've got a chandelier and everything is rosy and you spend three hours in there. Like, some people do that and that's amazing. I don't see a lot of real people that I know doing that. At least not sharing it with me, right? Maybe I need to get to know other real people. But, but like, we, I want to talk to you about how we, as real people with real lives and real needs and real problems and real relationships with God, start these spiritual practices that have anchored the church for millennia, okay? And uh, dig into that so that we can say not, okay, how do we do these practices like St. Benedict did? Or how do we do these practices like a monastic tradition or like the Anglican church or like how do we do these practices like they were done 500 years ago? No, how do we practice our spirituality in today's culture in a rooted and relevant way? That's what we're going to dig into, okay? And so to do that, we are going to look at the lives of four people in the Old Testament. Today we're going to study Hagar. Craig Rochelle, okay, so... Here are some excuses I've heard lately for not being rooted. Mm, I just don't have time. I need to get work done. Uh, I'll do church at home with my family. We don't go to church. We are the church. Right? We just have so many great churches around. So what I do is I take some time to take care of myself on Sunday morning, and I listen to five podcasts. And then I'm all filled up with all these nutrients because it's really hard to decide which church to go to. They're all so great. And that's just church attendance, you guys. That's not scripture. Read, like, that's one practice, right, of excuses and excuses and excuses. Craig Groeschel says, do not re- reduce church to listening to a podcast. It's so much more than that. It's community. It's worshiping with others, praying for others, hurting with others, serving others, being involved in the lives of others. We're not even talking here about prayer or meditation or solitude or celebration, right, or confession. All of these things, though, all of these practices are actually necessary to find clarity in our calling, to strengthen our church, and um, to just flourish in general as human beings. So we're going to put this little piece that's on your handouts up here. Bottom line, it's through our individual callings. We got that one? Yeah. It's through our individual callings that nutrients are absorbed and distributed. Does that make sense? In our individual callings in relationship with God, we absorb nutrients and we distribute them because calling always responds in outward service to something. Okay? It's in ancient paths and spiritual practices that nutrients are stored and our faith is anchored. It's those things we can go back to when we feel dry or weary or like we're, we're hungering and thirsting for things. Okay? And it's our local church that protects and cares for the community it's been planted in so it can grow in new life. In... Um, 2 Peter, I'm going to read to you from 2 Peter uh, in the message, verses 5 through 10. And it's not going to come up on here, so if you want to write it down on your notepad, um, 2 Peter 1, 5 through 10, message version. Basic faith requires good character, which demands practice over perfection. If you're trying to build good character in your life, you have to practice at it. If you want to be patient... You can't be perfectly patient on the freeway the first time you try. At least I can't. I can't be perfectly patient the first time I want to be patient when I'm standing in line at Walmart. And my baby's crying, and they don't know what's going on. You know what I'm saying? I can't. I have to practice patience. Practicing patience, practicing good character, looks like intentionally choosing the longest line in Meyer. So that I can choose patience that day. 
so that when the freeway incident comes up and my children are looking at how I respond, my response naturally, because I've practiced and disciplined myself, is patience and creativity. Want to sing a song, guys? This is great. Tell me about your day, right? Rather than, oh my gosh, don't talk to me. What are you doing? Right? Who's trying to call? Right? So basic faith requires good character, which demands practice over perfection, even though a lot of times we just want perfection. And it is these practices that provide clarity to our calling. It's when we are all clear on our callings that our body is strong. So in 2 Peter, come on, phone, in the message, it starts, oh my gosh, you guys. Okay. Phones. It says, we were also given absolutely terrific promises to pass on to you. Your tickets to participation in the life of God after you turned your back on the world corrupted by lust. So don't lose a minute in building on what you've been given. Complementing your basic faith with good character, spiritual understanding, alert discipline, patient practice, uh, pr passionate patience, reverent wonder, warm friendliness, and generous love, each dimension fitting into and developing the others. With these qualities active and growing in your lives, no grass will grow under your feet. No day will pass without its reward as you mature in your experience of our master Jesus. Without these qualities, you can't see what's right before you, oblivious of your old sinful life that's been wiped off the books. So friends, confirm God's invitation to you, his choice of you. Don't put it off. Do it now. Do this and you will have your life on firm footing. Sounds like being rooted. The streets paved and the way wide open. Sounds like clarity. Into the eternal kingdom of our master and savior, Jesus Christ. So let's dive into some sacred roots. You ready? Okay, so there are six church practices, and I need to clear right away that these are not my ideas. This is a synthesis of a lot of different people's ideas, okay? So uh, the six church practices that we'll be talking about are actually pulled together and articulated the way I'm going to talk about them by Gabe Lyons, who runs this organization called Q Ideas. And then we're also going to be talking about some six basic universal human needs, which have been developed by Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins and Chloe Madonis, okay? Uh, so we're going to start there. Today, the two practices that we want to look at are context and confession. So our two spiritual practices, you can fill this in, are context and confession. I'll explain what those mean in a second. Ready? And then the two human needs are variety and certainty. We all need variety in our lives or things start to feel not like alive, right? If, you're, if everything's the same all the time, it's dead. So we all need variety and we all need certainty. We get this in lots of different ways, right? But these are two basic human needs that these practices speak to and meet. So... With every practice, there's a question that we're answering, all right? The first practice, context, um, we got there? We're answering the question, where are we? Okay? Like, where are we in the story right now? Where are we in this cultural climate? Where are we in history? This is the practice of understanding our cultural climate and then also understanding the way to move forward from there. If I acted like I was in the cultural climate of Zambia in Marion, Indiana, I would not be rooted, nor would I be relevant. My clarity, would be, my clarity around my calling wouldn't be existent, and my church would probably be really confused about what's going on, right? But if I understand the cultural climate that I'm in, and then also the way to move forward from there, then that gives my life some spice. Does that make sense? It adds that variety in that says, okay, here's what my cultural climate looks like. Here's who I am. This is the way to move forward. You start getting creative and connecting with people that maybe you wouldn't have connected with before. And this 
practice of context goes way, 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 way back. The church has been doing it since the beginning, right? The second uh, practice we're looking at today is the practice of confession, which answers the question, what do we believe? The practice of confession is knowing and naming the truth about reality, about ourselves, and about others. So what do we believe? Knowing and naming. It's not enough to just know it in here. Confession is about starting to name it out there. Okay? So we're going to look at Genesis 16. And we're going to use this story of Hagar, um, who is one of my favorite stories in the entirety of Scripture, um, to start to understand um, why these two practices are important. And this girl kind of started them. Okay? So we're in Genesis 16. You guys can turn to Genesis 16. Okay. So up until this point, we've had a whole bunch of stuff going on, right? To give you a little bit of context, this is in the book of Genesis, which just means beginnings. It's just the beginning of everything. It's the beginning of the world. It's the beginning of cre- like humans and animals and weather patterns and uh, like God trying to relate to humans and all this other stuff, right? And it's also the beginning of sin and corruption and darkness. And what happens after Adam and Eve are in the garden with God, they sin, they're exiled from the garden, and they start having children. Well done. They start having children, but those children are jacked up too. They start killing each other and, like, stealing from each other and lying to each other. And they start saying, like, that's your land. Don't come into my land. This is your land. This is mine. Like, don't cry. You know, like a child would in their room that they're sharing, right? Like, put the duct tape down along the floor. Do not cross over. That's what was going on. And then it got to Genesis 6, and it says that every inclination of every man's heart all the time was evil. Can you imagine if you woke up this morning, and from the time you woke up, every single inclination, every single thought, every single thing you did was only evil all the time? That was the whole world except for one man, Noah. Okay, so things are getting really bad and really messy. And so then this flood comes as a way to redeem humanity, actually. And after the flood, Noah's three sons and their wives start populating the earth again. But again, they screw it up. Again, it's a big mess. And God, what do you do with a big mess? Usually like a really, okay, I'm not talking like clutter. I'm talking a huge mess. Like your garage or your, right? (laughs) Okay. Or your attic or that storage room. Like, what do you do with that? Most of the time you just look at it and you're like, oh, snap. And then you close the door and walk away because you don't know what to do with it. But the thing that always works is just starting somewhere. It's not that, like, there's this process whereby you pick the perfect spot to start cleaning up the wretched mess. You pick a corner or a table or a drawer, and then you start moving out. So Abraham was chosen as the place where God started cleaning up the mess, not because he was perfect and special and just right, but just because he was a man and a place to start. Up until Abraham Everyone thought that gods were based on location, which makes a lot of sense if the stories you've been told your whole life were that God was present in a garden, and then when you moved out of it, you were separated from him, right? So all throughout history, we've been told God is the God of this garden, and then people are separated from him, and they're like, well, who's the God here, not in the garden, because here's the God in the garden. Who's the God here? So they didn't know. They, did, they didn't know if because they had mini wheats for breakfast, that's why it rained. 
Like, they didn't have relationship with God. They just tried to be in the right place at the right time with the right God in that right location. And so when we, when we get to Abram, God actually talks to him and says, I'm calling you out, you got to leave Ur. So he starts making this journey, but he doesn't know what he, where he's going, and he doesn't know if God's going with him because God was in Ur, but he doesn't know if he's going to be anywhere else. So guess where he goes first? The place where he knows where other gods are, Egypt. Huh, okay. So he goes to Egypt, and they lie a little bit about who he is and who Sarai is, and then people start getting sick, and the Pharaoh gives Abram, hang in there with me, this is all going to make sense. He gives Abram maidservants and manservants and cattle and sheep and all these gifts, and Hagar was one of the maidservants from his first trip to Egypt, okay? So when we get to Genesis 16, she's been with Abram's clan for about a decade. Abram's already received his promise that he'll be a nation, but he has no children yet. So in chapter 16, now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. When we hear that, we're like, that's messed up, Sarai. Like, why would you, what? Here's the thing, though. Sarai knew about the promise, but she didn't know she was part of it. The promise was given to Abram, not to her. And in that cultural context, it was her job, her responsibility to build a family for this man. That's all she needed to do, and she couldn't do it. So based on the law, the actual, like, code of the time, they were, she was absolutely within her rights and responsibilities to choose a surrogate from among her servants. It's common practice. So she's like, okay, I want, I want to help my husband out. God's promised this thing. He's getting old, right? Here's my maidservant. She'll be a surrogate. We'll be able to have a son or a daughter, a child at least, right? So Abram agreed to what Sarai had said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Why? He loves Sarai. How many of you have been pregnant? Sorry, guys. Yeah. (laughs) If you got pregnant, no matter who the daddy was, no matter who the daddy is, if you get pregnant and you have a life growing inside of you and someone else says that's their baby, right? So of course she started to despise her. No matter what the culture was of the time, no matter how acceptable a surrogate was, it wasn't Hagar's choice to be the surrogate. They weren't paying her, right? right. They, she was just supposed to deliver this child. Of course she began to despise her. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. This is typical. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Abram responds, your slave is in your hands. <laughs> like, this ain't my mess, Right? Your slave is in your hands. Do whatever, do with her whatever you think best. So then Sarai mistreated Hagar. Why? Because hurt people hurt people. Not because Sarai was some villain, not because she, but because she was actively trying to pursue God's promise for her and her family's life. And this chick had the audacity to be like, nope, I'm going to put an obstacle or roadblock in your way. So, Real bad situation. Kind of toxic family environment, right? Uh, So, (laughs) so, uh, Hagar flees. In verse 7, the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. Okay, can we switch to the map real quick, Annette? Is that possible? And then go back. Okay, so here's the deal. 
this, there's like a bunch of do dots up at the top. See all those dots? About the third dot down, third and fourth dot down, are called Mamre and Hebron. That's where Abram and his clan camped out, all right? It's where, um, yeah, where all the stuff happened, like where the angel of the Lord visited and he, ha he entertained those three servants and all of that stuff, all right? Now she leaves Hebron. She flees the way of Shur. You see this dotted line? Okay, that's where she's going. This says river of what? Egypt. Where's she going back to? Egypt. Why? It's her home. She can have her baby in Egypt. It's her baby in Egypt, right? Maybe she won't be called Hagar anymore in Egypt. Maybe the, she'll get her real name back in Egypt. Hagar is a name that was given to her by this clan that actually means like the spit in the back of my mouth. Okay? It means the one that was drawn out. And it's, onomatop it's an onomatopoeia, kind of like buzz or boom, right? We know what the word is because of the sound it makes. With Hagar, it's like Hagar. I'm being for real. So every single time someone said her name in his clan, it's like, this is what your value is. This is how much you mean to us. So yeah, I might go back to Egypt, right? And right here, this dot is where she lands. She's not, she's not back in Egypt yet, but she's gone a pretty long way, right? She's almost there. Okay, now we can go back to verse 7. Verse 8, uh, yeah, the angel of the Lord found Hagar near the, a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur, right, Be, right beside there. Um, and he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. What? The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. Okay, this is really important. So whose descendants will he increase? Hagar's, not Abram's, not Sarai's, Hagar's. What happens in just this, just this part of the conversation is that God gives her authority over the child that she's carrying. What? Okay. And he promises that she'll increase in number. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant. You will give birth to a son. What? That was kind of a big deal. You wanted sons more than daughters back then because they could inherit stuff and get a name for you and take care of you when you got old. Like, daughters you had to marry off and that sort of thing. They had to just keep getting pregnant. Um, now, and here we go. You'll give birth to a son, and you shall name him Ishmael. Ishmael means the Lord hears me. For the Lord has heard of your misery. Okay, why is this? In, we're going to keep going, but first, I, why is it important that she gets to keep her son and that she gets to name him? It's important because naming, I'm just going to take a little bit of time, naming here in the Old Testament means three things. One, it means that um, she gets to say what her son's character is or will be. A name in the Old Testament was representative of your identity. So that's why Jacob met the supplanter and he lived that out. Like, he supplanted his brother. He, oh, he was a deceiver. That's what Jacob meant. So, of course, when he received a new promise and a new identity after wrestling with God, they changed his name to Israel. Okay? They, so you get to change your name in the Old Testament if it's not who you really are. Also, if you name something or a person, it meant that you fully understood them. And the third thing is that Naming implies that the one who's doing the naming has authority over the one that's being named. So Abram would have been the appropriate one to name everyone in his clan, not 
Hagar. She would have no naming rights whatsoever, not to herself, not to her offspring, none. So the fact that God not only says, this baby is yours, and you will name him, and you will name him, God hears. Okay, that's kind of a big deal. He will, verse 12, he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. That kind of sucks. She, (laughs) right? 13, she gave this name. Okay, hold on. She did what? She gave a name to the Lord, which is the Hebrew word for Yahweh. It's Father God. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her, you are the God who sees me. This is the first time in scripture anyone has named God. And it comes from a slave girl named Hagar, who all of a sudden, because of an encounter with God, realizes she has power and authority, and her life is transformed. So not only does she name her son, she names her God. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Bir Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son he had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Okay, so, so wait a second. What? Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son. What we have to realize in the context of this passage is that Hagar went back, not to the same place and position she was in before. She went back with authority and encounter with God that no one else in the world up until that point had experienced yet. It was so, so important that in the cultural climate she was in, that her way forward was back to Abram's clan instead of into Egypt. Because the revelation that was happening in Abram and Sarai and Hagar had to happen together to strengthen and root what would then be the church and the Jewish faith and community. If Hagar would have gone to Egypt with this knowledge of God and not gone back to Abram and Sarai, they would have entirely missed out on a God who desires personal relationship rather than you to be in the right place at the right time. They would have totally missed out on a God that says, your value is so not negotiable. Doesn't matter on your circumstance or experience or if you're performing the right way or not. Her way forward was the road back to Abram. And their way forward, Abram and Sarai's way forward in their cultural context and where they were was to listen to a slave girl and name her son, not their son. This was totally culturally opposite of what should have been happening. The son that could have fulfilled promise for Abram the son that could have been his descendant through which God created many nations, the son that could have like, answered all of their problems and solved, like, hit all their fears in the face. He said, something happened with this God that I met and he met you too and he told you that it was your child and we should name him Ishmael, so we will. And he'll grow up as yours. That was so selfless both Abram and Sarai, but it all happened because Hagar went back and she started confessing. She started confessing what she knew and understood to be true about reality, about herself, and about others in that place. So here's what's next. Hagar had some, cult, some context problems. We've got some context problems, right? Like there are things in our cultural climate that suck, Stink. Sorry. There are some things that really stink about our cultural climate. It stinks that babies are neglected. It stinks that people don't have access to any form of education certain places in the world. 
It stinks that children grow up being unloved. It stinks that husbands and wives are abused. It stinks. We got some context problems, but they're not any worse than Hagar's, right? She had some context problems. So here are the questions about your context. What is yours? What gives your life variety and spice? She was a pretty spicy chick. <laughs> what makes your experience special? What makes it hard? What do you most want to run from right now? All The answers to all these questions are all part of your cultural climate. But the reason that context is important is because you cannot effectively change what you cannot measure. Let me say that again. You can't effectively change what you cannot measure. So you won't know the way forward if you cannot see the road you are on and where it's leading you. Some of us are just wandering around, spending a lot of energy, not even knowing what road we're on. So figure out your road and where you're going forward. And then here are our points of confession, the things that we know. These are the last three statements down here. The reality is that God is near and knowable. This is a confession, a truth that has rooted the church throughout history. He's not far off. I heard someone say the reason God's whispers is because he's close. It's not because he's trying to make it so you can't hear him. It's because he's really close. The reality is that God is near and knowable. The second thing is your value is not negotiable. Within the kingdom of God, it does not matter what your name is, your identity is, your background is, your circumstances are, your experiences. Your value is precious, and that's not negotiable. And the third thing is that relationship brings forth unpredictable revelation. Being in relationship with my husband has brought forth some unpredictable revelation. So it can be good revelation, it can be bad revelation, but it doesn't matter what relationship you're in, relationship always brings forth unpredictable revelation. And it does that with God too. So these are three truths that we'll continue to confess. So who has their brown piece of paper? Everybody got one? Great. Uh, if I could get a couple of ushers with some buckets, we'll have you walk up and down the, the aisles in just a sec. Thanks for hanging in there with me. We're almost done. So on one side of this brown piece of paper, this is what we're going to do. On one side of this brown piece of paper, I'm going to ask you a question around your context, and you're going to answer it on that side. And then on the other side of the piece of paper, I'm going to ask you a question about your confession. You're going to answer it on that side. The ushers are going to gather these up, and then we're going to make roots out of these pieces of paper that you'll see next week. Okay? That's cool. That's cool. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, on one side, your context, I just want you to answer the question, where are you? Maybe you're at a crossroads. Maybe you're in a desert or a wide open space. Maybe you're on the corner of Fifth and Gallatin. <laughs> but where are you at in your life right now? Just a real short sentence. See who right and what else. Okay, now on the other side of the piece of paper, I want you to just write, He is the God who, and fill in the blank. He is the God who, and fill in the blank. So from Hagar's context, her confession was, He is the God who sees me. From Abram's context, and his confession was, He is the God who provides, which P.S. actually in Hebrew just means continues to see me. And he knew that because of Hagar, you know, it's kind of cool. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, uh, he is the God who sees me or he is the God who provides. Um, 
But who, those are some common confessions. So who is God to you? He is the God who rescues. He is the God who redeems. He is the God <laughs> who's mad at me. He is the God who, whatever is true for you, okay? Thank you, Caleb. All right. And if you wouldn't mind when you're done, just pass your papers toward the middle and we'll dump them, the, whoever's on the end of these rows, we'll just dump them in the buckets. Okay, so you guys going to keep coming back? Because it'd be really bad if, like, there were five people here next week to hear about the next part. Thank you, thank you. So next week, um, next week we're going to talk about Nehemiah, and uh, there the two practices we'll be focusing on are identity, who you are, and formation, formation. How will we grow? I look forward to that time with you guys. And are you closing, DJ? Okay. Um, and thank you for listening and for allowing me the privilege to speak with you today.